let me just turn this on, but um, thank you very much for the warm welcome and thanks to the event organizers. It's been a really nice. Um, I was in Finland this morning and now I'm in Malmö and tomorrow I'll be in Stockholm. So it's quite a whirlwind, but I'm, I'm really enjoying myself and I did see the city center today. Oops, this is not how to turn it on. One moment. And it was beautiful. So I'm just very happy to be here. But I don't know how to turn this on. But in the back, you can hear me anyway, right? So maybe I don't need it. Okay, yeah, they can hear me. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Hizmet movement. The Hizmet movement is also known as the Gulen movement, but that term is actually not, you know, the term Gulen movement is not appreciated by those that be, that are part of that movement because that emphasizes the uh, the name of the founding figure. It's kind of like calling a Muslim a Mohammedan instead of calling him a Muslim, uh, which is the values of Islam, to be a Muslim, to submit yourself. So the people in the Hizmet movement uh, prefer that term because it means a service, and that's their, their highest value is to carry out service, ultimately to God, right? And the Hizmet movement's been in, in the news right now in Sweden because you've got the, the prime minister of Sweden Christensen recently uh, was asked by, by Turkey's President Erdogan to deport uh, the director of Stockholm's, I think it's called Freedom Foundation, something like that, Freedom, Stockholm's Freedom Foundation, and his name is Bülent Kines back to Turkey where, where he would definitely be jailed. He'd be immediately jailed. I mean, that's the point of deporting him, right? <laughs> so, you know, so people in uh People here must be wondering, you know, what is this movement? So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Hizmet movement, and then I'm also going to talk about some of the challenges that the movement has faced recently in the aftermath of the 2016 um, coup, coup attempt in Turkey, uh, after which uh, President Erdogan purged Turkey of all of those he considered opposition. Um, the majority of those he purged were from that movement, from the from the Hizmet movement. And then I'm going to also talk about um, so the challenges they face and how do they process those challenges religiously? How do they actually manage to um, try to not rebound? That's a bad word, but try to become re-inspired to carry out service. Right? Their name, the name of the movement is service. How can you carry out service when you've been purged from Turkey? How can you do that? It's, it's a very, you know, your very identity is to carry out service. How can you continue to carry out service when you've been purged? So let me just talk about the movement a little bit in the first, to start with. So since uh, the 1990s, the Hizmet movement participants outside of Turkey have opened over a thousand schools, in fact, uh, way over a thousand schools. Uh, they have schools all up and down the coast of California. I, at one, you know, they had uh, and centers, not just schools, but centers, cultural centers. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of mosques. There's... Um, Inter interfaith dialogue centers, and they carry out the, you know all of these act all of these different organizations carry out activities like uh, like coffee night where people get together to talk about a given subject, or Turkish cooking night, or uh, like Ebru art classes, or some other um, type of activity. Um, there's even lecture uh, series. Uh, and the movement actually began way before the 1990s. This is just the activities it carried out abroad. But it began uh, with the, I mean, the, the, so the founder of the movement is Mr. Fethullah Gulen. He was born in Erzurum. You hear sometimes 1941, sometimes 1939. But I'm going to go with 1939, okay? Uh, and so he began to preach in the 1960s. And he gained, he slowly gained more and more followers. And, uh, and, and then, you know, he, he launched, he ended up launching a, 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 mo a movement that's, that perhaps was at its peak, perhaps one-tenth of Turkey, perhaps, maybe less. Okay, so somewhere between like four million to eight million people belong to this movement in Turkey at its peak. So the movement identifies itself. As a, as a Turkish uh, Sufi, Muslim, humanitarian, civil society group, okay? These days it doesn't identify itself as much as Turkish because right now many in the movement are pretty mad at Turkey, okay? So the movement has become more global, uh, especially since the purge when people were you know, forced to, to flee all over the globe. 
So here you have, here I have him as his birthday, 1941. Oh, well, so he's, he's publicly, um, like his, the, the values that he preaches openly and publicly include uh, peace, you know, you, you should be peaceful, you should advocate for peace, you should love all humanity, not just Muslims, you should love all humanity, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, everybody, uh, as, and, and, and nature, all creation of God as you love, as, as you, as you love God, God's self. But this has become increasingly difficult since the, since the coup attempt, because immediately after the coup attempt, President Erdogan pointed its fingers at the, at the Hizmet movement without conclusive evidence. Some scholars have said, well, there's circumstantial evidence, but there's, there's no conclusive evidence, okay? <clears throat> I don't know who carried out the coup. If you're gonna ask me who carried out the coup, I, I don't know, okay? I know that the people in the movement think it was staged by Erdogan's government. They have their reasons for thinking this. Other people think that the movement, perhaps, that some people in the movement were strategically, uh, you know, positioned to be able to carry it out. But at the end of the day, I don't know. But what happened to the people in the movement after this uh, coup attempt doesn't, you know, it, 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 there's no justification for, for um, detaining 500,000 people and jailing 100,000 people just because, you know, a few people did carry out a coup attempt. And, and again, I don't know who carried it out. So the question, the question I'm asking here is how do you survive this trauma? How do you survive this trauma and continue to quote, love all humanity? I mean, if your goal is to carry out service, if your goal is to love all people, how do you do that? How do you do that? You want to try again? Is it better? Okay. Is it on? Okay. Does that, you guys hear me better? Okay. <laughs> all right. So how do you do that? How do you manage to continue to carry out your your religious um, ideals when when you've been purged and when you're angry and when you've been thrown out of the country that you know you had to stand up and and even if you're Kurdish you had to stand up and say you know thank God I was born a Turk right even if you're Kurdish thank God I was born a Turk every day every day at school so a lot of the artwork that I have um, here is. Uh, created by children that are re refugee children of the movement, of the Hizmet movement in Athens with their parents' permission. And so here you see a, an image of the Medij River, also known as the Evros River, and a, a family or a group of people on the side of the river. Some of the pictures we can, I'll talk to you about and others I'll just let you absorb yourself, okay? But for those of you that are just, uh, you know, still confused about uh, like what is a Sufi order? I, I told you that I was trying to contextualize the Hizmet movement. I said it comes out of a long history of Sufi orders. I would say the Hizmet movement is a neo-Sufi order. Some people argue, they say, oh, there's no, there's no set tariqah, which means an institution, there's no place, there's no one person you pledge your, your oath to. But let's just call it a, a neo-Sufi order that falls in, uh, you know, in, in, that falls uh, in a long line of Sufi orders coming out of Turkey, including the Naqshbandi order, the Mevlevi order. Um, I mean, you've got, you've got other groups as well, uh, including the Nurja circles, which were launched by the thinking of Sayyid Nursi, also known as Sayyid, Sayyid Kursi. So um, in Sufism, Sufism is the mystical dimension of Islam, okay? It's the mystical dimension of Islam, and it has its own history. Well, I, I, I can't say too much about it right now, except to tell you that Sufis themselves would, would maybe say that they are interested in the hidden or the secret or the deep, profound meaning within Islam. Or maybe they would say, you know, we're interested in true Islam or the experience of God. And, and there's just so, so many ways to define Sufism. Um, in, in Arabic, it's tasawuf. In Turkish, it's tasawuf. And it's, it is this mystical dimension. And it's controversial because it, uh, you know, because in part of, of, its, of its particular history and because it has Sufi orders, because people pledge their allegiance to a Sufi sheikh. You have a, a, a murshid who would be your, your spiritual guide. And then the, the, the person who's following the murshid would be called a murid. And actually, that shows up in the Hizmet movement as well as the Abilik system. 
Okay? <laughs> yeah, that does show up again. But uh, Islamic extremists have, have um, bombed and otherwise destroyed Sufi shrines uh, for, for quite a while now. <coughs> because they believe that Sufism is a form, they, they don't think Sufism is, you know, every, every in every religion, people argue about what the real way to practice is. And in every religion, you have extremists that, um, you know, want to hurt those that are not doing it their way. So in Islam, we have those extremists as well. So the word Sufi just comes in from the Arabic word Suf, which means wool, because Sufis, Sufis wore woolen garments. And I talked about the Morshid Murid relationship. You see that again reflected in the Abilik system, in which um, in which each person in the Hizmet movement has a mentor. Okay, has a mentor. Either a, a, you know, it's one of the Ablalar, which would be the, the sisters, <laughs> or one of the Abiler, which would be the brothers. Okay, right. And the sources of Sufism, some mystical themes in the Quran. Also, uh, the Prophet Muhammad and peace be upon him and, and his life and his sayings, activities, and some of the stories of the famous saints um, in, in Islam, like Rabi al Adawiyya and others. So, Sufis believe, and it's hard to say that, right? When you say Sufis believe, of course, not all Sufis believe anything, right? <laughs> you know, I can't speak for all Sufis. So, I'm speaking in general. They believe that you are supposed to. Um, control your ego. In Turkish, this is nefes, and in Arabic, it's nafs. Right? Yeah, so it's nafs. Yeah, it's, so you must control your ego, but you have to go beyond that. Beyond that, you really are supposed to obliterate your ego and attain fana, which means that you kind of don't exist anymore because you've submitted yourself so completely that then you're one with God. Okay, and this is an image of Sufi dancers in Hyderabad. I just thought it was lovely. Uh, this, this, uh, you know, th these circles are supposed to uh, reflect some of the organizational structure in the Hizmet movement. Now, there is no, you know, special card that you carry, or no, there's no handshake, there's no special tattoo, <laughs> nothing like that. It's a very fluid structure, and many people have described the structure as as having concentric circles. So at the middle, the very center would be, of course, Fatullah Gulen himself and those that are immediately around him. Okay? And then you've got um, high ranking Abilair. Okay? Right? There is a little patriarchy there, right? The, the Abilair, that's the brothers, the high ranking uh, religious leaders. And then you have um, other people, you know, that are also, you know, less ranking and less ranking. And then also the concentric circles on the out, outside are because that some people are participating in the movement very loosely, just as a friend of the movement, or they're maybe just Turkish, they want to have Turkish teaching, uh, like language class for their, for their um, son or daughter. So, you know, it's, it's a loosely organized movement. It, um, another facet is that when the movement began, it was fairly secretive, and this should be no surprise to anybody, given the, the rampant paranoia in Turkey in general, okay? Uh, there, there's just many, there was a coup in Turkey in 1960, 1971, 1980, 1997, 2003, and then the recent coup attempt in uh, 2016, right? So different groups are, of course, very paranoid of, of you know, every group in Turkey, every, every group is paranoid of, of the other groups. And when I was in Turkey, people would change their phones like every couple months. I thought that was so weird, you know, from the American context. Really, you're going to change your phone? they would change their phone. Uh, and that wasn't just people in the movement. I also had some Kurdish acquaintances that changed their phone. Everybody changes their phone in Turkey. Uh, I don't know about everybody, but when I was there, it was a thing. Um, so I also, you know, and, and so the, the, Turkey, the Sufi orders in Turkey were banned by um, the, the, the secular state, by Ataturk secular state in 1925. So for a long time, being a member of a Sufi order was a big taboo. You could not openly be a member of a Sufi order, okay? So it's no wonder why people did not want to publicize their activities. So that is why the, the movement got a reputation for being secretive, okay? Because they could have been persecuted, you know, or been shut down uh, for being out. They couldn't, they couldn't until much later. They couldn't be, a, you know, a Sufi order. 
Uh, I also say that the, the movement has transnational operation. That's because especially after Fatullah Gülen left the left the uh, left Turkey for abroad in nineteen in the nineteen nineties, I think nineteen ninety nine, right? Um, then then uh, he also advised everybody to do a hijrit in Arabic hijra, right? Where you t where you leave like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, d left uh, Mecca for Medina. He encouraged people to go out to other countries to teach. And he argued that if you teach, this is, this, is your, this is practicing Islam. Teaching math is practicing Islam. Opening a school is practicing Islam. So he asked people to carry out their, their hijrit to, uh, and to practice hizmet, okay, abroad. So you have these transnational operations, and then the movement is now um, you know, in dozens and dozens of countries, all right, at its height in over 150 countries. Right now, some of the countries have shut the movement down because of the, uh, the, uh, pressure by, um, by President Erdogan. So yeah, so I, I told you they, they you know, they're, they're people in the movement are, are asked to open schools instead of mosques. The idea that teaching is more important than preaching. And uh, instead of preaching or proselytizing, you should model your Islam. You should be a good Muslim. Be a good Muslim. Don't, you know, don't try to shove it down somebody else's throat because they believe religiously that being a good Muslim is more persuasive. So in many countries, they've opened secular schools. If they have to teach religion, they do. But if they don't have to teach religion, like in the United States, those charter schools don't teach religion at all. They're just secular schools, but they believe that they're practicing Islam by teaching. Because uh, Fethullah Gulen has said uh, that you, know, you can combat ignorance and uh, you know, better society through teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, this is an Islamic value as well. Education, of course, is, is a is a core Islamic value. So, what makes the Hizmet movement unique from other Sufi orders? I mean, there's a lot of things. Okay, one of the things is that uh, Gulen emphasizes action. Sometimes when I watch people in the movement, you know, I have some acquaintances, friends in the movement, they tire me out. They <laughs> like. There's always another sahbet, right? And there's always another lecture series, and there's always another uh, charitable event to organize. So uh, there, there's like a, a, you know, a, a massive emphasis on action. And this is different, because some of the Sufi orders, you're actually, you know, everybody carries out dawah, which means that you, you know, Muslims carry out dawah, which means you take Islam out. <coughs> um, but some of the Sufi orders, a lot of their practices are internal. Remember, you're supposed to try to achieve oneness with God. All right, so some, some people are, are much more internally focused. The Hizmet movement is very externally focused, very much about action in the public realm and about education, humanitarian activism, also interfaith dialogue. You know, who's attracted to the Hizmet movement? I, a, a wide variety of people in Turkey, but I've noticed, don't get mad at me, anybody, I've noticed some left brain people tend to be attracted to the movement, maybe in part because the movement has emphasized math, technology, science, engineering so much. So people that, that like those fields tend to gravitate towards the movement. I've also noticed that people, some people, like I've just noticed, okay, I don't know if this is really true, but I've really noticed lots of people that tell me that they, they, they joined the movement because they didn't have like a solid family life. Right, like they, they just didn't have a great family life, and they found family and camaraderie and values that they agreed with in the movement. Okay, so here's some of the stated uh, goals of the Hizmet movement. I'll just pull them all down at once: to create a new generation of moderate, spiritual, educated people able to engage in democracy, pluralism, co contemporary world to carry out interfaith dialogue with all different groups. They've been deeply criticized for carrying out interfaith dialogue by, by Muslims, by the way, by Muslims have deeply criticized them for this. Uh, to build bridges between communities. You know, they, they tend to say things like, uh, we, we would like to take walls and turn them into tables, right? The walls that divide people, we wanna turn them into tables where people can eat together. Ziyaret, ziyafet, you know. <laughs> That means that it's, it's, it's this Zed Afe. Zed Afe. Okay, it, it's this idea in in uh, the Hizmet movement that you should visit each other and, and you know provide food and <laughs> and that this is the way that you keep everything you know it's a very persuasive way to get people together. We like eating. 
<laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do like eating. Yeah, and then you know you break down the stereotypes of the other, so we can celebrate humanity and all nature. Okay, that sounds really great. Does the movement do this all the time? Is this always successful? Of course not. The movement is comprised of human beings who have these ideals, many of them, not all of them, but many of them have these ideals, and they achieve them imperfectly at different levels, at different times in their life, but, but it's a, these are goals. These are some of the stated goals of the, of the movement. Uh, Fethullah Yulan himself has said very like, lovely uh, statements like this one. Love is the strongest bond that God has created amongst us. It's a chain that links all of humanity together. It's a very beautiful statement. He's not saying it's a chain that links all of Muslims together. He's saying it's a chain that links all of humanity together. And so this is an image of um, some Nigerian girls, but also an Indian girl, if you see on the right, uh, at a, one of those countering violent extremism conferences that I attended in Nigeria. And the, you know, so here's another quote by Fatullah Gulen, and it describes the ideal human. Now, of course, this ideal human that Fatullah Gulen describes is very hard to achieve, especially when you've just been purged from a Kugel coup and you're a refugee. So I'm going to read some of this. They dream of being beneficial to people. They feel sincerely in the depths of their spirits the agony and depression of others. They adopt a welcoming stance to whoever visits them. Listening to their problems and grieving for them, they seek out the grief-stricken uh, ones and rush with people who share the same passion to relieve the pain of others. Um, at times, they bravely face difficulties and plant roses with determination, even in the midst of thorns. They are constantly singing of roses. How do you do that when you when you just cross the the Everos River? And you know you have very little money, and you landed in Greece. You have to get a fake passport, and you try 15 times to get out of Greece, and you land in Germany or Sweden, right? And you, you, you have you, your relatives are still in Turkey. How do you how do you be this perfect human? How do you even maintain some of these ideals? So so we'll talk about that. But but first, why is why is the movement so unpopular in Turkey? Because I'm sure that you've heard. That in Turkey, uh, the movement has been banned uh, FETO, which means uh, the Fethullah Terrorist Organization. <coughs> so we held some event at my university for the refugees where they showed what they brought in their luggage. And I got a letter from the Turkish government saying that, um, that I was uh, helping a terrorist organization. Yeah, so I threw that letter in the mail. <laughs> but I mean, there, there's there's some complex reasons why it's not always popular in Turkey, and of course, it's not totally true that it wasn't. That, I mean, it, it wasn't completely unpopular. Some very high-ranking officials put their children in the Hizmet schools. They taught they taught science, math, technology, and they were really well-run schools. Okay, so a lot of very high-ranking, very famous, very wealthy people had their children in these schools. And then immediately after the coup, took their children out and said that, you know, this whole group is a terrorist. They're all terrorists. <laughs> okay, so the, the Kemalists lost power. They're, that's a secular group in Turkey. And in fact, so when Ataturk um, was founded Turkey um, in the 1920s, right, he uh, established a secular state. And so people that follow him are called Kemalists. And so when he, when they, they held power for decades, but finally uh, they lost, and, and this, by the way, let me just tell you that this secular state was not secular like, like Sweden or secular like the United States. Maybe Sweden and, and the United States are sort of passively secular. They still allow manifestations of religion in the public realm. Like it's okay to wear your headscarf in Sweden and in the United States. But in Turkey, you could not wear your headscarf. And if you, uh, you know, wore it, you were, you could be, and you were overtly discriminated against. In many cases, uh, also if you wore your your little skull cap, uh, th there's a lot of research about this, about the discrimination that took place against religious people in Turkey. But so, in order to counter the Kemalists, the movement made an alliance with the AKP government, which is led by Erdogan. This was an uncomfortable alliance, but it allowed 
both of those groups, and in fact, there was a, like a coalition of different religious groups, different Sufi orders, as a matter of fact, the, the Naqshbandis were also aligned, right? Uh, so this, this coalition, this alliance, allowed religion to become more overtly practiced in the public realm and allowed people to be less discriminated against for doing things like wearing their headscarf, just simply put. <clears throat> After the Gezi Park scandal, in which, uh, not scandal, uh, the protests, the Gezi Park protests, in which um, people were, from all walks of, of life, were protesting the, the government's attempt to turn a park into a, a mall and a parking lot and, you know, just to ruin the park, right? Uh, the movement started to become very wary of the government because President um, Erdogan actually had very heavy-handed tactics in clamping down on that protest, including using tear gas, uh, water cannons, and jailing people. And then there was another uh, crisis. Uh, Erdogan's son was found to, and, and some other high-ranking officials were found uh, to be involved in a, in a uh, corruption scandal. And Erdogan blamed the movement for, for infiltrating the judiciary and, you know, like smearing his son with this charge. And so he retaliated against the movie, movement. They became, they became less, uh, not just less friendly with each other, they became enemies at that point, okay? After the graft scandal, after that corruption scandal, they became enemies. Um, and, and so then that's when, even before the coup attempt, that's when the movement uh, had many of its schools uh, begun to shut down, and uh, journalists in uh, Zaman newspaper uh, were were fired. And, and in fact, the, the newspaper pa the newspaper itself was shut down. I would have thought like China or North Korea or Russia. I would have thought that that would be the place, a country in which um, you know you have the highest number of journalists in jail. Well, it's Turkey. Okay, it's Turkey. Did you know that it's Turkey? So many people were um, in Turkey. Why is it unpopular? Because some people thought, okay, this is a secretive group. Like if you're not in the movement, maybe you would be annoyed by the history of secretism in that group. Maybe you just had a suspicion of, of Sufi orders since they've been banned for so long in Turkey. Uh, maybe you thought that since they became so popular, they were popular, they did have power, they did have money at the, at the high point, okay? They had hospitals, radio stations, televisions, uh, television stations, um, uh, universities, uh, Zaman newspaper, etc., right? And even schools outside of Turkey. So one of Erdogan's accusations is that it's a parallel state seeking control of Turkey. And clearly he was challenged by, you know, he was threatened, he felt threatened by the power that the movement had, because otherwise why would he bother to clamp down on them? And then there's that paranoia in Turkey of others that I mentioned. And I said it has to do with those coups. It also has to do with the geopolitical uh, position of Turkey, right? It's, uh, there's a long history of Turkish people saying we don't want to have enemy, any enemies because we have Russia to the north, we have the Middle East over here, and we have Europe over here, and we feel kind of isolated. We feel um, nervous about our positionality. So many, you know, you hear this refrain over and over again that, you know, Turkey should have zero enemies and Turkey doesn't really have any friends and... Uh, but then the movement, in fact, was accused of being too Western, which is kind of funny because it did actually, um, in some sense, Islamize Turkey. Many people joined the movement. Some women began to wear the headscarf because they were just inspired by the movement's values. But it was seen as maybe too Western because, uh, um, because people thought, that, like, you know, because the, the, those more conservative people, Muslim communities, thought that, they, that the way that the women dress and also the men dress was not Islamic enough. They didn't wear the, the, the big beards. Um, uh, women were not wearing the black abaya, that kind of thing. They were also accused of being too Muslim by the secularists. Many people, you see, you can find articles about Fethullah Gulen is gonna create a Turkey that's like a Saudi Arabia or um, Iran, right? But then you also find articles about uh, people worried about Turkey becoming Christianized somehow because the idea is that Fatullah Gülen was being accused of being a crypto-Christian, or a crypto-Jew, by the way. Crypto-Jew was also thrown around. And, and uh, as of the, the secret Christian, that he was the secret 13th cardinal okay, of the Catholic Church. So all kinds, of, all kinds of accusations. And sometimes you'd find that the same journalists 
would make the same, you know, different accusations. I don't, you know, it's hard to believe that the same journalist thought he was both too Christian and too Muslim. <laughs> like, come on. So the Hizmet movement internationally has a fairly good reputation in general, okay, depending on who we're talking about, but in general, it's allowed to exist in many countries. Um, it hasn't been shut down in, a, in the majority of countries in which it exists, in which it's operating. And so many people, like in California, they find that it operates with spiritual humanitarian goals. But in Turkey, people are still suspicious um, of, of seeking power to, to carry out some secretive goal. Right? And here you have this image. We want democracy, not caliphate of Gulen, as if the Hizmet movement is trying to have a caliphate like ISIS or something. Uh, but, but then... But then we get the coup attempt. I was actually flying to Turkey that day. That was going to be a mistake. But I, you know, I landed in New York from California. Opened my phone. My students were saying, "Don't take your next flight." You know, look at the get to CNN or on the TV. So um, the coup attempt uh, killed almost 300 people, and over 2,000 people were injured. So this is an you know an awful thing in Turkey. Uh, that happened, and that ha it seems to happen almost every 10 years. Almost every 10 years, since 1960, right? Almost every 10 years. Many people in Turkey are quite fed up of this, um, of this behavior of their own community, of their own you know, fellow pe men, fellow people. All right. So Erdogan although he was fairly liberal-ish when he was first elected back in 2003, had become increasingly authoritarian, and in fact, we can call him a populist, okay? Like Putin, Netanyahu, Trump, okay? Um, Zeman, and others. And populists always have a scapegoat. It's right out of the populist playbook. And so in the case of... Um, Turkey, right after the coup attempt, like immediately after the coup attempt, without waiting for any um, clear evidence or proof, President Erdogan said that he believed it was the, the, the Hizmet movement behind this coup attempt. But actually, the purge did not only target the Hizmet movement, but also the Kurds, the Alevis, the, um, the military, Erdogan's own military. He read you know, structured his own military. He fired hundreds of, of officials. He fired his many people in his judiciary, many mayors, and, and then continued to fire people. I mean, he just fired lots of people uh, after the coup attempt. Let me see if that's where it was. Yeah. Okay. So he also ended, you know, he declared a state of emergency, which allowed him to, uh, to have his officials carry out uh, human rights violations with impunity, like they can't be punished, okay? Uh, and according to Amnesty International, all kinds of human rights abuses, including rape, including torture, and I have heard of rape stories and torture stories. I've, I've, I've heard, you know, people, um, you know, I've interviewed people and they've given me their rape stories and their torture stories. And, and so there's a lot of different, there's a, a lot of uh, documentation about this. All right, so these, these, these measures that, um, that, that took the state of emergency uh, was you know, created, that were established by it, were normalized and they continued uh, you know, for, over, for over a year. Okay, and, and in fact, uh, longer than that. And uh, the government continues to, to target all kinds of groups as part of its crackdown. And it shouldn't surprise anyone. I mean, I already told you that uh, Turkey jails more journalists than anybody else. And it shouldn't surprise anyone that Turkey has shut down over 190 uh, media institutions, shut down or taken over. And so, um, you know, the press in Turkey that's allowed to operate is operated by the government, by and large. So it's, a, it's about 3,000 private schools and institutions closed down. About 150,000 people were fired and suspended. 500,000 people detained, 100,000 arrested, and, and I told you about that, the, the media. All right, so a child drew, drew this image as well, a teenage girl of a, of a refugee camp. And let me just uh, point out, so what happened after the, the coup attempt is that uh, people who were either in the movement, um, either went underground and started to, you know, they hid, or they, uh, you know, some people left the movement. Uh, they denied any involvement in the movement. 
Uh, but a lot of people ended up um, leaving Turkey. And uh, we have actually more displacement than we've ever had in the world right now. I mean, it's just like awful. Humans are awful to humans. I don't understand what's going on right now. But it's about one in every 100 people is displaced right now. And displacement has devastating effects. Okay, and so, you know, 84 million display, people displaced, 35 million of those displaced people are children. Um, 27 million of those displaced people are, are refugees. And then leaving Turkey, just, just in two years alone, 2019 and 2020, you have 30,000 Turks that, that, that leave Turkey. And, you know, the irony is, of course, is that many people in the Middle East, uh, they, they applaud President Erdogan for his, you know, for cre creating a haven for Turkish refugees. Over 3 million Turkish refugees are living in Turkey. And Erdogan actually flouts that. He holds, you know, Syrian children in his arms while waving a Quran. And uh, he positions himself as the Devlet Baba, which means, you know, father of the nation. And, and in some ways, father of the Middle East, you know, he, he, he wanted to be a role model. Uh, but people don't often know this story. They don't, you know, they don't know this story that, in fact, he also created refugees. Okay, he created refugees. So here's another image. This looks like a, a, a woman praying for people in jail. Teenage girl do that. So Hizmet has wounds, right? Hizmet has wounds now. How do you be an ideal human? How can you be an ideal human when you're so wounded? <laughs> it's hard, right? It's, it's very hard. It's quite a challenge. So what are the wounds? Being called a terrorist, a feto. A feto. You know? Uh, that you have to hide. That, that many, almost everybody uh, has somebody who, who was in jail. If you weren't yourself in jail, okay, uh, that you that you had to flee, like like an illegal person in the middle of the night, um, that you have a refugee status. Nobody picks a refugee status. Nobody wants to be a refugee, okay. There's a lot of um, stereotypes about refugees that they are, you know, sort of uh, pathetic, um, passive victims, and nobody wants that label for themselves. In fact, every every person that has a refugee identity, that's not their only identity. That's only one facet of, that, that's, a, that's a label often that other people affix to them, and uh, they have so many other facets of their identity. And, and there's also lots of resistance stories. But wounds, loss of family, career, identity, social shunning, sometimes people's parents disown them because this idea that you betrayed Turkey, you know, you... You must have carried out the coup the Turkish president said you did, and you must have it, so you betrayed Turkey. And in Turkey, Turkishness has long been a religion. Turkishness, right? This, thank God I was born a Turk, even if I'm a Kurd, I have to say thank God I was born a Turk. It's, it's, you know, it's a religion. And to uh, violate that is, is very, uh, even if you didn't violate that, even if you didn't violate Turkishness, but just to be associated with a movement that the president has said that violated it, it has broken up families and friends and neighborhoods. People report on each other all the time. Okay, so then, and then just it's sad for many people to lose that Turkishness. Although I've met many people who say, look, Turkey deleted me, so I'm going to delete Turkey. Okay? And then, of course, they cry because they want to go back, right? But, but then they're mad again. They say, I want to delete it. I'll never go back to Turkey. And then, of course, of course, they do miss Istanbul and, you know... <laughs> Okay, so how do you know how, how do what you know how do you recover from this? One way to recover is to tell your own story. Okay, the problem is the people in the movement can't tell their own story. They can't post on Facebook, Twitter, or so any form of social media. They can't write um, newspaper articles because they have family members still in Turkey, who will then also be jailed and maybe tortured, raped, whatever, and so they can't. But Jill, who's an accountant, she says, our stories are all different from each other. But each story is special to the person telling it. Each story is a puzzle piece of the bigger puzzle. So I really like that quote, actually. I, 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 I love that quote. So I'm going to tell some of the stories. So Sui is a Turkmen, but from, from Turkey, right? She's married, and her husband was in jail. And she said, I want to say something about delivering the baby. 
Normally people are, were, are happy, but I was sad. I didn't want to deliver. I had no husband, no family besides me. And then Bulut is a lawyer who said, after the coup attempt, I always woke up at 4 a.m. wondering when will they come. A lot of people have problems sleeping even today because they're worried about when the knock at the door will come. When I was hiding, my father died and I couldn't go to his funeral. One of my friends reported me and one month later, the police came to my house. My lawyer friend reported me. He came to my house a lot of times. I helped him with his cases. He knew me, but he wanted to save himself. So here's some prison stories. This is Yusuf, a lawyer. He cried when I interviewed him. He said, they beat us. They tried to get names. They hit me in the detention center everywhere on my body. They carried out every type of torture. They zip-tied me. They didn't cover my head, but they just hit me everywhere over eight days every day. But he was proud of himself. He was proud of himself because he didn't tell any names. He kept telling himself, if I give 10 names, those 10 people will give 10 names. And then those, those 100 people will give 10 names. You know? So he was thinking, I'm protecting so many people if I just don't say anything. And he didn't say anything. So he was very proud of himself. But he did cry when I interviewed him. This is uh, art by an adult who was, who was tortured. His name is Maher. He wants me to tell you his real name. His real name is Maher. Okay? I really like the middle image because he's still able to feel love. At least he drew himself feeling love. Maybe he wanted to feel love. I don't know. But at least this, this you know, he, even though he's counting off the days, right, there's still some love coming out of his heart. So here's some stories from crossing the, the Evros River, also known as the Medage. So after crossing, I kissed the first tree I saw. Because it wasn't in Turkey, I felt my burdens were lifting. I felt I hadn't breathed deeply for years. And now I could breathe. That's fear dose. Uh, Yesma said, we took a cab to the Evros. Then she started crying. When we came to the Evros, I was unhappy. I left my family. But I felt the people who died there, whose bodies were never found, when I got to the river, I felt them. That actually messed me up for a while. I went to the beach one day to go swimming, and I had to get out of the water fast, because I, I threw up. Because this idea that there's people like dead in the water, that just totally messed me up for a while. I couldn't swim. So here's some, some lovely images, although, of course, disturbing. I'll just let you look at them for a moment. Now, these images by children are, are, of course, really moving. I mean, my presentation would not be the same without any uh, you know, powerful images with, by these children. And I just want to point out that political conflict almost always victimizes women and children more than, than men. We used to think of two lines of, of soldiers shooting at each other and their male, male, sword, shoulders, male soldiers. But that's, this, is not how warfare this is not how warfare takes place anymore. Uh, just recently in Ukraine, a maternity hospital was bombed, right? By Russia. A maternity hospital. Like, where, well, what have we humans become? A maternity hospital. So one of, the, one of uh, President Erdogan's strategies is to detain pregnant or postpartum women. So women that are about to give birth or who just gave birth. They, he, he detained a bunch of them. And that, of course, in a Turkish patriarchal society, you know, is, is quite... Um, like devastating to the whole family, to the whole community. It's, 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 it's very um, scary. And so Zeynep, who, who was a teacher, she, she had this to say about that. She said, the government tries to, to scare women first, to spread fear in society. Spreading fear, if it happens to men, that's one thing. But when it happens to women, they have children with them. So it hurts the entire family. It makes the whole family and society scared. If you look at this image, this might be my favorite image, or drawing rather, right? Because you have a broken heart, but you also have a Turkish flag and a Greek flag, and you have the Evros River flowing in between, and you have the you know devastating things that happen in Turkey, and then you also have a, a girl who drew it, and she looks like she doesn't think she has a voice <coughs> to me. I always want to find her and tell her, you have a voice, you know? You have a voice. 
Your picture is your voice. This is another image by, by Yusra. Um, so this is of her mom and dad, Ani and Baba, right? And then there's Ahmed and, ya and Yasser and Yusuf. Um, actually, Ahmed, Yusuf, and Yusra, right? And then, and then the, the second panel, if you see there's a little number in the middle, right? One and then two, is when Baba's in jail. And so Baba, uh, we're, the, the image is interesting because we're kind of in jail with Baba. That's how she drew it. Do you see? We're in jail with Baba on this side, of the side of the bars. The third image, they're leaving Turkey um, for Greece, and the mom is smiling. The kids are actually, if you look closely, they're, they're crying. But, the, but Yusra drew her mother smiling, which I thought was a very powerful thing to do, to acknowledge that her mom was brave. And then they, she, she dreamed, she had not yet arrived to Germany, but she was dreaming of arriving to Germany. So she drew this dream of Germany that there'd be love and birds and that you know, she'd be so happy there. And they tried 19 times to get across with fake passports. The mom removed her headscarf so that people would think she's just a tourist. But 19 times sent back. Finally, you know, in California, I got a bing on my phone. I looked down, and there is an image of the three kids on the, on the airplane like this. You know, they, they finally made it to the airplane. And I was like, oh, God, thank God, 19 times. You know, it's hard not to care. Of course I care. So this is just an image of refugee clothes and shoes. There's a like a place where you can, if you're a refugee, you can go get new shoes. And they're not new; they're they kind of rotate amongst the refugees. In Greece, in Athens, where I I did my research in 2018, 2019, and 2021. <clears throat> okay, and so when we think about again, how do you pick yourself back up? If you're all about carrying out service and being an ideal human and and loving all humanity as, as you love God, how do you do that when this happened to you? So one way in which um, the movement has tried to do this, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, is by spiritually reframing um, their, their experiences, okay? And, the, and, and in fact, Sufism is, and Islam really, is, is very, you know, very fertile for doing this. So the, there's a quote by Mevlana Rumi that it goes, you know, the cure for pain is in the pain. Good and bad are mixed. If you don't have both, you don't belong with us. <clears throat> and so Fatullah Gülen himself has, has made the, the, um, the argument that prison, which is sorrow, can actually lead to spiritual growth. And how does, uh, how does it lead to spiritual growth? Because when you, as a Sufi, feel separated from God, that actually helps you. That pain of the alienation, that huzun, that sorrow, can help you move towards God. It helps jolt you. The pain helps jolt you to, to remember to get you know, going with your Sufi journey towards God. But Fatula Gulen's idea is that you don't just you know, have pain and then, you know, and then everything's fine. You, if, you, if you can transform your huzun, your pain, through, through, his, uh, through his mit, which is service to others, you can actually arrive to some sort of hoshkudu, which is empathetic, pluralistic engagement, which can help you. So I've seen people, you know, talk about how they are cleansed now after their horrible experiences and how losing their millions of dollars actually made them better people because now they realize that um, like the dunya, the worldly items are not as important as God, right? But then, of course, they also cry because it wasn't fun to go through that. You know, people also cry about it. But this, this idea of huzun can also create um, solidarity. It has deepened the ties between members in the movement. The movement is probably more connected than it used to be in some ways because they have a shared um, trauma that they are all trying to survive. All right, so here's a, a lovely image of a girl who just got out of the Evros River and she's dripping and she's looking up at the Acropolis. And so another saying by, by Rumi is, uh, a Sufi was asked, what's forgiveness? And he answers, it's the beautiful fragrance that flowers give when they're crushed. So it's this idea that out of your pain, you can actually have spiritual growth. And people in the movement uh, have spoken about this quite a lot. So, so um, Julian has also said that the pain of alienation of God that serves as that starting point um, is, is, you know, is a Sufi trope or Sufi theme that actually helps you when you have these awful experiences 
realize that you are also like the um, sacred figures of Islam's past. And indeed, people, when I interviewed them, talked about that. For example, Hilal says, I learned loneliness. Hajar, Abraham's wife, uh, now I understand her situation. I've read about her, but now I have more empathy for Hajar. And uh, she said, I learned nothing is as important as Allah. In the past, I thought of this, but I never experienced it. And then Maher, who was tortured, he's the, uh, he's the, uh, the one who drew these, these images. He's the only adult artist here. He said, what keeps me alive is to believe in God and family. I just pity those torturers who tortured me. I feel sorry for them. I feel terribly sad for them. I think that's very powerful to say that he feels sorry for them. That's very powerful. I also particularly like this one, although it's sad because they're in a refugee camp looking out, right, at, at things that are free, like a kite and birds. And it's just, just such a poignant image. All right, here's a couple of other stories about reframing trauma. Noor John, right, she, she told me, in jail, I read the Quran. I understand the Quran better in jail. I read different prophet stories and I thought it was just like my life. And Azra said, the Hizmet movement helped me. For years, we learned from the movement that together anything is possible to be a community. We never lost hope. We see the value in everything that we have. I learned that everything is valuable. I learned to stand strong in every situation. I can do my hizmet everywhere. Okay. So I think I'm going to skip this, this uh, quote just because of time. But you should look at the, the, the image. Let's look at the image for a moment. I like this image because I, I just noticed something about this image. Uh, just while I was in Finland. Uh, so there's... The, ch the child drew people uh, parachuting from the airplane, you know, to various countries in the world away from Turkey. But I just noticed that the exhaust from the, from the airplane is going straight into the country of Turkey, right? The exhaust, the pollution from the airplane goes straight into Turkey, hopefully into the presidential palace. So, you know, it, you know I'm going to conclude here. Uh, many of the people that, that in fact, uh, pro that, you know, they process their pain through faith. Of course, people also need therapy. They need medications. You know, sometimes they're devastated and, and they, uh, there, there is no solution. But this is the way that collectively, this is a strategy that the Hizmet movement has in their tool belt to help them uh, pick themselves back up from, from what happened. So many believe that they live the pain of religious figures and that they gain some spiritual understanding, that they have more empathy for others. People would tell me things like, I used to hear about Syrians drowning in the sea, but I never thought that each one of them was a person, that each one of them was a mother or a father or a history teacher. And now I do. Now I realize they're just like me, those, those refugees that drowned in the sea. They also, they also would say things like, you know, I learned that Everything I need is in two bags, and you know, as long as I have my family, right? Two bags, and so dunya is not important. The world worldliness is not important. And people would also say we now we now understand the meaning of freedom. That word freedom always jars funnily, you know, strangely with an American because people use freedom as a propaganda tool. The, the word as a, you know, America is about freedom. So, but that's not what they meant. They, they meant just like the ability to not be purged from your country. That's freedom. The ability to make breakfast for your child and you know, outside, you know, you don't have to be in jail separated from your children. You don't have to express your breast milk in a toilet, okay, because you're in jail. That's freedom. So justice, human rights, and, and the Hizmet movement. So in the future, um, the Hizmet movement you know, has a couple of crises that, uh, that it's facing. One is that uh, some people inside the movement have been critical of the movement, especially of the, you know, the Abi League system, right? Some people believe that the Abi League system, that the, the, this mentorship system has led to um, some corruption or has the potential to, to lead to corruption. So recently there's internal criticism uh, of, the, of the movement that was launched by some professors in California, actually. 
The other, the second crisis that could happen is that when uh, Fatula Gulen, who's about 79 or so, when he passes away, then how will the movement continue? In what way will the mo movement continue? But for now, there are actually still institutions, schools, hospitals, universities all around the globe. Just not in Turkey, of course, okay? But still all over the, all over the globe. And people do still try to heal from their trauma. And, you know, many people tell me that they would like to continue their particip participation in the movement. And so that is all. Thank you very much. <laughs>